Um, okay, Alexander, over to you. And I'll give you a one minute warning towards the end. Same. Thanks so much, Kyle. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Gates. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Data Science at the University of Virginia, uh, where I lead the Connected Data Hub, a vibrant and growing group of students and researchers kind of doing uh, research at the intersection of network science and computational social science. Um, today, I want to share a project coming out of my lab. So this is more of an academic research instead of a use case scenario uh, grounded in the Open Alex data set where uh, we were really interested in exploring the structure of global science and how that limits the potential or uh, accelerates the diffusion of ideas in science. Uh, so this is work done with two amazing collaborators, Indra Nomain and Jian Jian Gao, who I think is in the participant list here today and help answer some of the questions. Um, so global science, uh, the global scientific ecosystem is shaped by the emergent interplay between international collaboration and competition. Strong national research infrastructures empower nations uh, as they vie for competitive advantages in technology, economics, security, and health. But at the same time, science emerges on a global scale with scientific ideas disseminating from their nations of origin and influencing each other around the world. However, the strength of influence is not uniform across all communities. And this leads to a strong striation in uh, different countries where they're differentially recognized for their scientific contributions. So the easiest way to just represent this is through the amount of uh, the number of publications coming from any particular nation. So here we kind of uh, size each country based on the log number of publications. And you see by far it's Western centric, right? Focused on uh, just a few nations who are producing most of scientific knowledge. And so this leads us into our major questions here, which is what are the structural patterns that actually underlie international scientific recognition and influence? And do they have consequences for the diffusion of knowledge across national boundaries? Uh, a lot of previous research focusing on the structure of global science has kind of uh, focused on the, the analogy of a core periphery structure, which originates from the economics literature, right? And this is the idea that there's a few core nations that are at the center of scientific knowledge production, and then most nations and their scientific infrastructures lie on the periphery of this network. And this has several consequences, right? It actually um, has been shown that a core periphery structure inhibits diversity in the system as the core acts as gatekeepers on deciding what knowledge is actually scientific legitimate knowledge. Um, it creates large knowledge disparities because those core countries, again, have access to much more knowledge than you would have on the periphery. It impedes the diffusion of knowledge, again, because they act as gatekeepers. And these core periphery structures are actually self-reinforcing because once you're at the core, why would you ever want to move out? Um, evidence for the structure abounds, but some of the more prominent ways of looking at it have been um, some, some recent research exploring the structure of collaboration networks. Uh, but these collaboration networks are highly biased by the number of publications or the volume of publications coming out of each country. Um, and what we also know is that a, a lot of scientific recognition ecosystems are biased by regions and cultures. And so this has, again, an influence on um, what science is allowed to be published, where it's allowed to be published, and how it's recognized within the scientific ecosystem. Uh, this has led a lot of people to say that the core periphery analogy is just a Western-centric view of science, and it ignores the diversity of different national contributions to science coming out of the global scientific infrastructure. So that kind of uh, starts us off on our journey. What is the true shape of global science uh, influence, and how can we measure that? Um, so the outline for the talk today, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to our measures and the networks that we're allowed to build out of those, uh, some insights we've gathered about the structure of global science and how that's actually been fragmenting over the last 20, 30 years, and then finally some insights into the fusion of scientific ideas. This is based on a preprint. It's available on the archive. The QR code is down there in the bottom, so I encourage you to uh, you know, do a much deeper dive. I'm just going to be breezing through a lot of the, the details here in the short time period. Okay, so um, we start from the Open Alex data set. Awesome, it powers a lot of the work that we do in the lab. Um, and we've processed this using our open access um, uh, Python package, PySciSci, which we've built to kind of do a lot more of the advanced bibliometric analyses that one might wanna do, um, uh, including a lot of the normalized measures, uh, topic modeling, and a lot of the advanced network modeling, uh, 
all the code for this project is all open source and on there. So you can go ahead and reproduce the results using OpenOps right now. Um, so in order to talk about uh, a measure of influence between nations, that's not biased by the volume of publications, we introduce a new measure grounded in the traditional AUC. So we look at the number of citations which emanate from a country to another country. And then we ask, does that differ from the background distribution of citations emanating from the source country? Uh, and this is actually equivalent to the Man Whitney UP test. So we can actually do some statistical significance and identify only those links which are statistically significant in the network. So that means that if other links appear that are not statistically significant, we can actually eliminate those from our network. And this measure uh, gives us a measure of over or under citation. And so we uh, capture those through positive links in our network or negative links in our network. Um, just as another caveat here, we know that there are many different uh, sources of bias uh, related to national um, scientific ecosystems, which may be reflected in the citation network. And so in particular, self-citations of the author to themselves are, of course, going to bias the way that we view um, citation within the network. And also, uh, it's been shown that if you share the same affiliation, you're all, you have a, a you're more likely to cite another researcher from the same affiliation, right? So again, at the national level, that would just reflect a, a, a greater increase in self-citation bias between countries. Um, and so we can just eliminate those sources of bias by eliminating all references in the citation network that uh, are either from share a same author or share a same affiliation. So it's a very conservative view of removing these, but I think it works pretty well. Okay, um, so some fun tidbits before we jump into the network, we can get uh, temporal views of how one country views another country. So here, our citation preference measure, uh, the value of 0.5 is a neutral value. And so, for example, China over the last 30 years has been fairly neutral to the United States, but the United States has undersighted the work from China quite prominently over that same time frame. And then you can uncover some interesting geopolitical stories. So here is US and Germany. Uh, originally, they hated each other right after World War II, and we've now come to appreciate the work coming from each other's countries. Um, the strongest citation preferences, uh, you guys didn't know there would be a geography quiz here, but usually I do a little silhouette game, which, which countries are these. Um, anyway, the, the strongest uh, citation preferences that we find are actually between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, who have been growing uh, over the last um, 15 years, really, that we can capture them in our data. And we also see some diverging preferences. So this is India and Singapore, where the work um, in India greatly favors those coming from Singapore, but Singapore has been undersighting the work coming from India. Okay, so these are fun temporal stories. Uh, we can put it all together and look at the network, emergent network structure that evolves out of this. Uh, this is just the positive links. And immediately you can see that this is not just a traditional core periphery network, that we identify several prominent communities in this network. Uh, they're not just Western centric. So each of those communities are grounded in different uh, geographic regions and they promote the work within those regions. Um, surprisingly though, if we overlay the negative links on that, you find that most of the negative links are between those community structures. Right. And so what that means is that we find a strong fragmentation where uh, within a community, you're very supportive of each other's work and you tend to oversight the work coming from other countries within that community. But between communities, you um, tend to undersight that work and disvalue it. OK, um, so quick question. Can we predict these national preferences? We built a big multinomial logistic model to try to predict uh, both the presence and the sign of a link between a source and target country. We do fairly well at this task. It's not, it's a pretty hard task in general, uh, but it allows us to actually explore how a bunch of different control variables might influence the presence of links in this network. Um, so here's a quick forest plot of everything that's going on, but I'll call your attention to a few of the variables that we looked at. One is common language. So if two countries share the same language, that greatly increases the risk uh, the, the probability of a positive link between those countries, and it decreases the uh, probability of a negative link between those countries. Uh, we also found that the presence of bilateral trade agreements in technology and science, which are thought to actually enhance the ability of countries to share ideas, uh, decreases the probability of there being a positive link. So we don't have a good causal reason for this, but it suggests that 
they're more of a band-aid on a problem and not curing the actual problem underlying uh, the collaboration and diffusion of ideas through, between countries. Uh, so there's a lot of other interesting stories here. I'll, I'll also say that like we get results which deviate a bit from collaboration, which is the traditional view of this. And so we really are providing new lens into the structure of global science. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip through this for time. And the next question that we were really interested in was how does this global network actually constrain the flow of ideas? Um, and so in order to do that, what we do is we take all of the publications out of OpenAlex, we grab their uh, abstracts and titles, and then we run a special keyword extraction mechanism on those things. Um, so we thought about using some of the topics and, and uh, were, uh, keywords that are extracted in Open Alex, but those are two coarse grained actually to do this analysis. We need many more than, than one minute wide of data set. Cool. Um, and so ultimately, what we do have is a time series of uh, which publications um, emanating from which countries mentioned which ideas and where were those ideas first mentioned. And so what we can do is build a uh, predictive model that says, okay, for all the ideas that say emanated from the United States, what proportion of them are then uh, at some point in time mentioned again in another country? Um, this model shows us that actually the uh, there are a bunch of factors that do influence that predictive capability, but the, the most important ones were the presence of positive or negative edges within this network. And having a positive edge uh, increase the odds ratio of uh, an idea diffusing between two countries by about 50%. And the presence of a negative edge in this network decreased the probability of an idea diffusing uh, between two countries by 30%. So these networks uh, really are capturing an important as aspect of how information diffuses within global science. So uh, the key point there is the structure of global science limits the diffusion of ideas. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, for your time and attention. There's a preprint available online, as I mentioned, and happy to answer any questions there. That's great. Thank you to all three speakers. Um, big round of applause virtually for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll go into Q&A. So if you're, in, if you're an attendee, go ahead and get your questions lined up. Um, but thanks again for the, the presentations.